Hello, testing one, two, three. Uh, I hope that uh, all of you are doing well. Uh, wherever you are watching this, uh, Hong Kong, the Caribbeans, I don't know, Ontario. Uh, stay uh, let me just uh, try to make sure that the system is right. In the meantime, uh, what you could do is uh, have a look at this particular question. Uh, this will be the question for 2019 Zone B on the law of contract. Uh, you should be able to see my screen uh, because I have shared my screen with you. And whilst you're reading through the question, uh, hello, hi, my name is uh, David, David Chang, uh, and I teach the law of contract, intellectual property, commercial law. Uh, these three are the main subjects I teach on. Uh, there are some other subjects which I also teach on, uh, but uh, those are not my favorite subjects, uh, whereas I specialize particularly in contract, commercial, and IP. Obviously, for the law of contract, uh, you find that it's a uh, compulsory subject. Whereas for commercial and IP, these are option papers. Uh, commercial, whilst it's an option paper, it's one of the more popular option papers on the UL exam course because of its obvious practical relevance in commerce in the general working world. And so people like to do commercial law. Uh, but somehow IP, um, there is that general <laughs> apprehension by many students and they think it's tough. Uh, but it's not uh, really. I mean, it is tough, but uh, I think that given the value that you could get out of IP, I think it's worth it uh, in that you can consider doing IP as an option paper because we are surrounded really with so much intellectual assets, uh, more so increasingly, isn't it, uh, in the 21st century uh, where things are going digital, things are going really beyond what is physical and the value of a company the assets of a company very much lies in the intellectual property. Uh, so to the extent it's a great option, should you choose to do it uh, when you reach your final year. Uh, without much ado, uh, this is question four, 2019 Zone B, uh, Law of Contract. Uh, some of you are watching and I recognize your names. Uh, earlier on when I was on the Facebook page uh, and I would have taught you or I'm teaching you contract law or commercial law. Uh, the good thing about this question uh, is that if you look at this question, you can see how there is an overlap between uh, the topic that exists in contract law and commercial law. And that is where one look at this question, uh, you ought to know what topic it is on. If for any reason that you don't know what topic it is on, then it may be that it's good that UL has postponed the exams to July, uh, then you have more time to prepare for the exams. In any event, of course, it's October as well. Uh, and that's right, uh, this is a topic on terms and on exclusion clause. And it's there every year on the exam paper. And so the reason why I chose this uh, firstly is because it's a topic that comes out every year uh, on the UL contract law paper. And also secondly, because it is overlapping with commercial law. Uh, and I do see or teach some of you uh, in Hong Kong for commercial law. So I thought that this would be that common topic that both groups that I teach currently in Hong Kong can benefit from. Uh, in fact, this is also a good question because it focuses on the Consumer Rights Act. As you can see here now, uh, we have Lockie who buys uh, goldfish or goldfish fish. And uh, Lockie most likely is a consumer. Uh, of course, it's arguable. Uh, we were not told really of his profession. Uh, but I think that the absence of any mention of his profession uh, is indicative that he's not buying this for a purpose of his business. And so he's a consumer and therefore that would attract the Consumer Rights Act. Uh, so I'll say more of this uh, shortly afterwards, uh, but by now you would have finished reading the question and we're gonna start shortly. But just before that, a couple of our general basic uh, classroom management as it were. Uh, right now I have my screen on uh, and I see my slide, I see myself. Uh, but I don't see the Facebook page. Uh, in other words, I wouldn't know 
uh, if you are watching and who is watching, I wouldn't also see your comments. Unless, of course, uh, you're on Zoom with me. Uh, but just that uh, for now, I thought that I want to do it purely on Facebook Live as opposed to inviting you to come on board on Zoom. Uh, but it maybe I do that really because uh, Zoom, I suppose, is a bit more private uh, as well as a better control on my part uh, where I can issue you a password and all that. And it's more secure like that. Uh, and more importantly is that if you are in this Zoom session with me, I can see you typing your comments. You can talk with me. Uh, so there's the benefit as well, uh, which I might uh, offer uh, before it goes. But otherwise, uh, you're on Facebook Live and uh, there's no way you could communicate with me except by typing your comments. Uh, so feel free to do so, uh, especially to the end of the class where you have questions or maybe even during the session, type it in. Uh, but just to let you know, I am not watching uh, the Facebook comments, so I don't know what you're talking about. Usually when uh, people have this kind of uh, webinars or trainings, uh, I'm sure you know this, they have uh, two persons, uh, a moderator who answer questions and the one who conducts the lecture. Uh, in this case, it's just me alone. Uh, I don't have an assistant uh, by my side to respond to your queries. Uh, so therefore, I will only address any questions that you may have at the end of the session. Uh, so either I will address it uh, during the session itself, or I may just take your questions and type in the answer on the Facebook chat comment uh, when we stop the video. Uh, by the time we finish, it could be quite late, right? Maybe 3 a.m. Uh, no, not 3 a.m. Huh? Uh, maybe, I don't know, 11.30 perhaps. Uh, this is a, a, an area where I could go on and on. Uh, I've done this question uh, previously uh, where I took one hour. I've done this question also on a separate occasion with a different group of people where I took three hours. Uh, it's a huge area. Uh, and I suppose I look at the time and depending as to how much time I have, I may then say more or less. Obviously, this is just a sample of uh, the huge area of what this topic involves, as well as what the law of contract is about. Uh, but I'll try my best right, to offer you this uh, so-called uh, assistance uh, during this period. Uh, I understand that many of you are locked down in quarantine because of COVID-19. I hope you are well and you're safe. Uh, and hopefully this was something that can benefit you as well. Uh, but of course, uh, I cannot be doing this uh, free contract classes or commercial classes uh, regularly. Uh, so if you're interested, you can always reach out to me and uh, I can see what other help I can offer you. Otherwise, I think for tonight, uh, this is something which you should be able to take back and uh, master and even be able to attempt this in exams on your own, right? Uh, so when you read this question, I want you to be able to sort of identify, and I hope you see my cursor right now as I move along the, the screen. Yeah? Uh, I would like you to identify the fact that in this question, there are two clauses at the bottom, last two paragraphs. And uh, straight away, many students will say, oh, you know, uh, I know what it's about. This is on exclusion clause. Uh, that's not wrong. But I want you to always be careful when you see questions like this. In fact, in general, a good exam technique for examination is always to be careful in the reading of a question where you know, read it line by line and be very careful with what you're reading. Uh, this is not really just a question on exclusion clause. It's beyond that. Perhaps the clause concerning the limited liability for 10 pounds, it's possibly, in fact, it is, an exclusion clause. But what about the last clause? It talks about the cancellation fee of paying 300 pounds. That is not an exclusion clause. And I've seen students now telling me that, hey, you know, that's a question exclusion clause. But it's not, uh, not directly at least. It is not a vendor, aquatics, the fish seller, excluding liability. Rather, he's saying that if you, the customer cancel, I will sue you. I will get from you 300 pounds for cancelling. So it is nothing to do with excluding of liability, but rather an imposition of a penalty on the other party upon premature or early cancellation. And so therefore the treatment for this question, insofar as those two quest, uh, clauses afterwards are concerned, we shall discuss it separately. Uh, where one, we discuss it as an exclusion clause. The other, the 300 pounds cancellation fee, is not an exclusion clause. And I think by now you could have guessed it right. 
Uh, and if I'm having a live session with you, I will ask you a question, you know, what topic it is on. Uh, I don't know whether anyone right now you are hearing me. And if you are quick enough on the keyboard to type in the answer to show off that I've taught you well. Anyone of my students uh, who know the answer? Uh, the minimum length of subscription is 12 months. Those who are cancelled before the period must pay 300 pounds. What clause is this? What topic is this? What law do we use? Since I've just said to you that it is not an exclusion clause, then what could it be? The answer is that this is an unfair term, right? Uh, and you want to treat and discuss unfair term differently from exclusion terms. Whilst all exclusion terms are unfair, not all unfair terms are exclusion terms. Let me repeat that one more time, right? Whilst all exclusion terms that excludes liability are generally unfair, but not all unfair terms are exclusion terms. Not all unfair terms exclude liability. And this is a very good example of that, where aquatics is not excluding liability in that second clause. Rather, he's imposing an unfair term on the buyer, right? Uh, so I want to just uh, begin my session by trying to help you focus on this particular main part of our answer afterwards. But I am jumping the gun. Uh, obviously, you don't start off your answer with that. Uh, the structure that I will present you now uh, in my next slide of uh, the screen or my PowerPoint slide that you can see here, where this is a structure that you want to use in general for all of your exam questions for terms and exclusion clause, right? Uh, where the structure will be as follows. You want to start off now by identifying the issues. And then having identified the issue, where you would want to then go on to identify the relevant statute that you use. In this instance, the reason why I mentioned SOGA or CRA is because you would have identified that this involves the issue of implied term, the issue of exclusion clauses involving a consumer. And so therefore, it could be SOGA, CRA, and that is something that has to be discussed. Do not assume that because you see a consumer, that it will be the Consumer Rights Act. It is not automatic, really. There is a process that you have to follow, and we'll discuss it afterwards. So this is the second part of what your answer would involve. The third part, of course, is where then you want to discuss uh, which relevant implied term. Uh, now, I use section 13, 1, 14, 2, 14, 3. Uh, this is the, the section numbers for SOGA. And I use that here because uh, many of you are more familiar with SOGA. Uh, the sections. Uh, for example, if you're my commercial law student, we would have done this in class. Uh, 13 is description, 142 is quality, 43 is fitness for purpose. So I use those section numbers for SOGA, uh, but correspondingly, of course, you have uh, the same similar implied terms uh, in SOGA that corresponds also with CRA. So my point is that discuss the relevant implied term uh, in the statute that you have identified. Then, of course, then having discussed whether or not is there a breach, and inevitably, almost always, there will be a breach. And then point four is we then discuss what are the remedies for the breach. And insofar as this question is concerned, because we will later discuss it under CRA, CRA has additional remedies and beyond that of SOGA, beyond that of common law. In fact, the correct way to describe it, to describe this would be to saying that the Consumer Rights Act will now provide to consumers statutory remedies. These remedies are not in common law. These remedies are not contract remedies. These are statutory remedies. You just take a look at your statute in your content page as it were now, the heading, it says very clearly, statutory rights, and then followed by later, statutory remedies. So these are remedies that are over and above what common law could provide which is now available by statute to consumers. And we discussed that in relation to the breach of contract or breach of the statutory right. Then number five would be, of course, the exclusion clause. And then finally, the unfair term. And so this is the structure that uh, you have. Uh, before I go on further, uh, I am not surprised that there will be quite a few of you who would want to ask me for my slides to be emailed to you. Uh, uh, unless you are my student, then yes, I will email to you. So hooray for those of you that I teach. 
uh, but otherwise, uh, no, uh, I will not make it available to you. Uh, so you have to then take down notes. Uh, so you are now all at home, quickly grab pen, paper, and take down notes, right? This is a class. Uh, and if you are sitting inside a class, you will be taking down notes, right? So let's do it that manner. Uh, and you will be amazed of the kind of value that you yourself derive or learn or benefit when you take down notes. Uh, sometimes watching a slide, watching a video, uh, is never as powerful as when you are taking down notes yourself. Uh, so although it may seem to be where you have to write down stuff and it's unfair, how come the other students that you know David teaches uh, gets materials? Uh, no, it's not unfair uh, because I'm sharing now with you that uh, by you taking notes, you benefit quite a bit from it. Yeah. Uh, so with this structure I've given you, uh, I have just coined an acronym that you can use. Uh, and that is this uh, I-S-I-R-E-U. Uh, if I had more time, I would try to think up of a more fancy acronym for you. Uh, so, you know, something that's more memorable. I leave this to you, right? I'm just taking the first letter of my six points, the issue, to identify the statute, the implied term, which section. Don't assume it's only 14.2. It could be sometimes 14.3, or it could be both. Then remedies are, then E, exclusion clause, and then U, unfair term, right? Uh, so this will be a very comprehensive structure, uh, I-S-I-R-E-U, for you to memorize and to use now to structuring for yourself uh, your answer for your coming question uh, or exams this year, 2020. Uh, in my opinion, you will get a question on terms and exclusion clause. Whether it's CRA or SOGA, uh, I can't say, it could be one or the other, uh, but the structure is the same, right? As you can see here now, just a particular statute that will change or the section number that will change. Uh, perhaps uh, if you uh, are interested, uh, I may do a class involving uh, B2B, involving SOGA, uh, whereas tonight we will focus on CRA. So just uh, post me a comment uh, on some of these things that you think that you would like me to cover, uh, and de depending as to the so-called popularity or the demand, right? Uh, I don't want to be covering a class and then later discover that it's only a small handful who benefit from it. Uh, so post me your comments uh, if you find this uh, lecture helpful, if there are some things you want to clarify further, or if you want me to cover other topics, right? Uh, post your comments. All right, so with that, uh, we want to now, so to speak, start off the main answer and I'll jump straight to it. I will not spend time talking about the introduction and all that, uh, that part you can do your own. Uh, in fact, your introduction can be here, uh, your issues, where you want to be able to raise the question and of course, discuss this as well yourself in answer on this first issue of, has there been a breach of contract by a seller? Now, you know it's an obvious thing, but you have to say it. You have to identify it. And what breach is this? In this instance, the breach is the fact that the seller has applied goods to the buyer and in particular, uh, there is some wrong chemicals put in the water. Uh, the question was what I showed you earlier on. Uh, what you can do if you want to access the question, I may show you the question later uh, when I go backwards, but otherwise I'll just move forward. Uh, I think you should quickly right now, and you are in front of a computer, right? Uh, just pull up the law of contract 2019 zone B. Uh, if you are attending this session and you did not get ready the question, when I've told you from one week back, it's on this topic, uh, then you just have to make do with uh, what I'm doing now. Otherwise, put up the question uh, side by side and we can go along. And so the bridge is the chemicals. They were wrong in the water that caused the fish to die. And of course, what term is it that's being breached? So again, A and B are related, but also different. Whilst they may be a breach of contract, but what term is being breached? Uh, it's breach, of course, and I'm sure you know this. Uh, one of the more popular, common implied term that is examined regularly. Now, sometimes they may have a variant or change, but usually it is this, which is on the implied term of satisfactory quality, which clearly in this instance, the goods do not seem to be of satisfactory quality. And then, of course, what then would be the remedies for breach? Uh, very frequently, people think that, well, sue for damages. 
uh, but it's not so straightforward because even in so far as damages are concerned, we want to be able to also discuss what kind of damages would be recoverable. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. What kind of damages would be recoverable? Uh, in this instance, for example, you are told very specifically of an expensive angelfish by the buyer, Lockie, who had died. Uh, he spent, you know, what, 20 bucks or so uh, buying uh, the goldfish or buying fish and resulting now in him suffering a loss of 500 pounds. It's many times over. So can you recover for this, right? Is that you spend a small amount of money, there's a breach of contract, resulting now in a huge loss, right? And so can you recover for the huge loss? So what are the remedies? And in fact, beyond just that of damages, uh, what are some other remedies that a consumer may pursue? And I did say just now that the CRA provide additional remedies to a consumer. Of course, then, as I said, what about the purported limitation clause that limits the liability by Aquatics, the seller, to only 10 pounds? Can that be recognized as part of a contract and therefore limit the damages? And of course, finally, what about the term that imposes a penalty for early termination, where you're supposed to subscribe for 12 months minimum, and the, the clause that you saw in the question, and any early termination, whether is it early termination by 11 months or by one day, you pay 300 pounds. And that seems so unfair, isn't it? Uh, so it's an unfair term that we discuss afterwards. So these are the five issues that we discuss. And within each five issue, there are sub-issues. We discuss them as we go along. Now, uh, in the relevant statute that I said that you have to discuss, uh, whether SOGA or CRA, I want to give you a two-part approach. And so if you are doing commercial law with me in Hong Kong, uh, you will find this to be very relevant as well for answering your implied term question uh, for SOGA. And you want to use this, where you want to start off by starting and asking the question of whether is this a contract coming within CRA. Leave SOGA aside first, right? The first starting point and the correct structure is this. And I'll say why afterwards. Always start off by examining, would the CRA apply to this situation, to this type of contract in question, insofar as implied terms are concerned. And whether or not the CRA applies depends firstly, there are three things, but firstly, is this within the type of contract that is regulated by CRA? CRA does not regulate all contracts, not even if you may happen to be a consumer. Uh, so please don't say things like, well, if you are a consumer and you make a consumer contract, the CRA will apply. Wrong. That's not accurate. The CRA, insofar as the statute in black terms are concerned, will only apply if it's a contract for the supply of goods or for services or for digital content software, right? Uh, and in, in this instance now, there's the first requirement or the first thing we discuss. Uh, second, of course, is, is there a trader in this contract that has transacted or made a contract with a consumer. So three limbs or three things to discuss. And the moment all three are satisfied, that's it, this will be CRA. Uh, the easy, of course, the easy one, of course, right, would be that of the first requirement where clearly it's a contract for the supply of goods uh, because we are told of how aquatics have sold fish uh, to the buyer. And that is not a service, that is not a digital content, it's goods. Uh, so I think that part is very clear, it is satisfied. What well, then about trader consumer, right? Uh, whilst again, it may be very obvious, uh, but please do not be presumptuous in your answer. The examiner needs to see that you know, and to, for you to show him the law, to explain the law to him. And so if you say that, well, clearly there's a trader here, Aquatics is a trader. Yes, that's a conclusion. But we don't only want the conclusion, but we want you to state the law that allows you to come to a conclusion. So when you say that Aquatics, this fish seller is a trader, the conclusion is right, but what law do you use to saying that? What does the law say in defining who a trader is? The quest afterwards, the definition of who a consumer is. A trader is defined in section two sub two of the CRA. Uh, you can refer to the statute for a more 
uh, in-depth definition. I'm just extracting the keywords here where it defines a trader to be a person acting for purposes relating to his trade, business, craft, or profession. And in this instance, uh, having put the law down, let's now show that argument or the process for us to come to a conclusion. And that is where we want to mention that in the question, we were told of aquatics being a local tropical fish shop selling fish. And so if you are a fish shop, as told in the question, and you're now selling fish, as told in the question, you are acting for purposes relating to your business. Which means this, if aquatics was not selling fish, if aquatics was selling, for example, now a handphone. Now, clearly now, whilst you may be a business, you may be a company, but then you are selling a handphone, is that a purpose related to your business or trade or craft or profession? The answer is no. Therefore, now there's then no trader in question, even though the entity in question may be a company. So please be very careful. Do not be so presumptuous. You see a company, Aquatics Limited, perhaps, you know, and then you say, therefore, company trader. No, it's not how we define a trader by identifying it to be a company. In fact, look at the word you see here. Again, my cursor may show it to you now. A trader is defined in two sub two as a person, not a company. CRA could have used the word company acting for purposes relating to its trade, but the statute did not use the word company. They used the word persons. And that term in law, and you may notice uh, more so when you do company law later, uh, the word person refers to natural persons, individuals, or legal persons, company. Let me repeat now, right? The word persons you see there on the screen refers to natural persons, individuals, as well as legal person, entity. And so therefore, even an individual, a natural person can be a trader. Uh, so that's why I say, please don't be so quick to think that it must be a company. An individual can be also a trader. In this case, for aquatics, whether aquatics, the name is a company name or an individual's name, it doesn't make a difference because it is a person and it's acting for purposes relating to his business. And so therefore, we said it's a trader and I put a tick, a blue tick there for you. Uh, what then about a consumer? And it's defined for us in section two sub three of the Consumer Rights Act of who a consumer is. And you may want to note that they don't use the word person, but they use the word individual, right? An individual who is acting for purposes they are now outside his business, trade, craft, or profession. Uh, so I need you to see this, that the use of the word individual clearly shows how the definition of a consumer today in view of the Consumer Rights Act no longer includes the possibility of a company being a consumer. The old law before CRA 2015 in the definition of a consumer in England included the possibility of a company being a consumer. You could have come across this case called R&B Custom Brokers and United Dominance Trust. This case of R&B Custom Brokers is a case that many students cite, which today has been overruled. Please do not mention the case. That with the case that you use to support the proposition that a company can be a consumer. But that's the old law. Today, a company can't be a consumer. Look at two sub three. It says it must be an individual. They didn't use the word persons, right? Uh, so therefore, it must be an individual who can be a consumer, but this individual must be acting for purposes that are outside his business. And in this case now, we were not told of Lockheed's purpose or his business or his profession. And so therefore we can assume that most likely since he is not acting within or rather he's acting outside his business, he is a consumer, right? Now, which also means this, if we were told of Loki buying, you know, 300 fish, Loki buying fish to resell, that's it. You may be an individual, Loki, this named individual, but now you're acting, buying within your profession to resell that fish that you have bought, then therefore this individual, although individual, will not 
be a consumer, right? Uh, so that's really how you want to structure your discussion. And then on the facts of this question, you can say three ticks, CRA is satisfied, or rather the requirements for CRA is satisfied, and therefore we will apply the Consumer Rights Act. So with that, we can move on with our answer. But just to give you a broader perspective, and again, more so if you are here with me, uh, and you are doing commercial law with me, uh, that's where then maybe this could be a SOGA discussion. That is, if either one of the requirements is not satisfied, very often, maybe it's not a consumer, right? Uh, it's perhaps now a trader with another trader, a trader with a consumer trade, uh, with an individual trader, or a trader with a company trader. I mean, I don't care. The point is that the buyer is not a consumer, he's a non consumer. That's it. Then, therefore, the elements in CRA is not satisfied, and therefore we discuss, could it be under SOGA? And of course, this part you all know, it then has to satisfy to someone of the Seal of Goods Act. Uh, two sub one here is SOGA. Whereas just now, uh, when I mentioned in blue, two sub two, that is CRA. In green, two sub three, the box, it is CRA, okay? Uh, so section two sub one lays down for us a definition of what is your contract for sale of goods. And only when two sub one is satisfied, then only will SOGA apply. There is a possibility that even two sub one may not be satisfied. Uh, you may recall uh, for my commercial law students, this case of OW Bunker. In that case, this was a sale of goods, but it was not CRA, but neither was it SOGA because it did not satisfy two sub one. Okay, uh, so there was something I would have covered as well with you uh, in our lectures uh, in revision as well. But for this question, let's move on. It's a CRA question. With that, let's now talk about the implied term in CRA. Uh, it's not 14.2. Huh? 14.2 is the implied term if you are discussing SOGA. This nine sub one of the CRA. So from henceforth, all references to a section or subsection will be the Consumer Rights Act. That implies a term for us that goods must be of satisfactory quality. So I think it's very clear uh, as to why we choose nine sub one and not the other sections or the other implied terms. This is the one that is of relevance in this question. Uh, but I want to give you a structure to discussing this in that even before you jump in and discussing and conclude that the goods supplied are not satisfactory quality, I put an A here now as like a initial discussion where you want to start off by discussing nine sub four. Nine sub four lays down three exclusions that could exclude nine sub one from applying. In that if nine four applies, and in 9.4, there are three subsections for which we'll discuss only two that's relevant here. So, but if 9.4 applies, then 9.1 can't apply. So I think that therefore should be a good initial starting point for us so that we want to discuss this as a filter to see whether could it preempt or prevent 9.1 implied term of SQ from applying. And what does 9.1 say? Uh, for example, it says that 9.1 will not apply as in goods does not need to be of SQ, right? Goods do not need to be of SQ. If it concerns anything specifically drawn to the consumer's attention before the contract is made. And it's so logical, isn't it? In that, for example, if I would have come to you and I say, I want to sell you uh, this handphone, but it's a scratch on the screen. The camera function does not work. I've now specifically drawn to your attention before the contract and you still buy from me. Now, later, when you discover that the phone does not work because of the scratch or the camera function as what I had drawn it to attention earlier on before, can you now sue me to say the goods are not of SQ? Of course not. Section 91 now won't apply. Uh, and so that's why this is the starting point, okay? Uh, so if you were to refer to the facts, uh, we were told, by the way, uh, I won't show you now the question, but in that question, we were told of Loki uh, selecting the fish. But we were not told of the seller notifying the buyer, Loki, of anything wrong. So in this instance now, this particular exclusion will not apply. Rather, what may apply is here, where the consumer examines the goods before the contract is made, 
which that examination ought to reveal. Uh, so if you are taking down notes somewhere, write it down that in this instance now, this 9, 4, B, 9, subsection 4, subsection B, right? So the second one. This is the one that will apply for discussion. Now, I'm not saying it will apply successfully, but it will apply for discussion, where we were told of Loki selecting the fish himself. Now, so obviously, and I think it's true, right? If you go to an aquarium fish shop seller to select fish, would you simply just say, give me one fish? No, you won't. You will choose the one that you think is most colorful, uh, most vibrant, the most beautiful, the biggest perhaps, and say, I, I want that. That's how we choose fish, right? Uh, it's, it's how I chose my fish when I was a kid. Uh, uh, I had some goldfish. And so we would then even, you know, when the fish is put into the bag of water, we will look at it against the sunlight. We'll check to see, is it okay? Any defect, any blemish? Uh, the fin, you know, could it be damaged? The tail, could it be damaged? And if I find that, hey, something is not right. This fish look very sickly. Does not seem to swim so well compared to the other fish that's more vibrant, more active. I will tell the seller, uh, I don't want this. I will put it back into the aquarium and I'll choose another one, right? So we examine and we select and Loki has done that. And so we want to mention this and discuss this now. But the key word is not so much as the first line per se, but the second line. The first line was where the consumer examines the goods, which he has before the contract. But now this next part, which that examination ought to reveal. The word ought tells you it is an objective test, ought. Would you think that by that visual selection, visual examination of the fish would reveal the fact that the water has wrong chemicals and therefore causing the fish to later die in five days time? Objectively, the answer is no a reasonable person would not have been able to discover that problem. And so therefore, notwithstanding the fact that Lockheed, this consumer, had examined the goods, but this exclusion in 9.4 will not apply successfully. So we strike out the first limb, we strike out the second limb, we strike out 9.4 totally. Section 9.1 can now proceed to be discussed. It may apply now to this instance, to this situation. So what 9.1 now says is that the implied term is that goods must be of satisfactory quality. So let's now discuss the meaning of SQ. And this is the part now that many students are quite good at. Uh, it's basically very statute based. So I'll leave it to you now to paraphrase the statute. Uh, but roughly you'll find that you need to understand how SQ is understood in two components. Again, this is true for CRA. Same is true for SOGA for 14.2, okay? Uh, so again, if you're my commercial law student, this whole part of the lecture, in fact, this whole lecture is quite relevant to you as well. 9 sub 2 deals with the standard of SQ. Is it a high standard or low standard, right? Uh, so it's that, what I would describe as that vertical examination uh, into the standard high or low, right? And then we use a test of a reasonable person having regard to the description, to the price, or any other relevant circumstance. Uh, say, take price, for example. Uh, if you pay a high price for goods, what is the standard if you pay a high price, a high standard, compared to if you pay a lower price? Description. Uh, if the goods are described as premium fish, imported from Norway, I don't know, right? Where, whichever country where fish is famous for, right? Premium grade A fish. Now, the description tells you that therefore the fish would be of perhaps better, higher quality. If I say this will be, I don't know, fish from the river, fish from the drain, they cost you 10 cents. The way I describe you the item and the price, of course, will tell you that you don't expect a higher standard, but rather instead a lower standard. So that is the standard of satisfactory quality looking at two so these factors. Uh, but 9.2 is only one component that tells you the standard. What is actually a more preliminary earlier discussion is not 9.2, but rather 9.3 in discussing the aspects of quality. So this is not dealing with the standard, high or low, 
rather the aspect of quality, which is more of, and I now use the phrase or the label now, more of like a lateral or a horizontal discussion of what quality encompass. Quality, you know, what are the different aspects of quality? And you can see here now, and all fun and statute, 93A to E are all in statute of the CRA, where fitness for a purpose is an aspect of quality. Appearance and finish is also an aspect of quality. Freedom from minor defects also. So there's no excuse really for a seller to say, small thing, it's only a scratch. It's a minor defect. No, our expectation as a consumer, or even in SOGA as a non-consumer, same thing is also here, so you can see freedom from minor defects, right? Also, not just that, right? The other aspects will be safety, durability. Now, in statute, there are five, but it's stated very clearly in the statute, it's non-exhaustive. It's not everything. And so there could be others, uh, but this, these are the five that we discuss as mentioned for us in statute, but if there are others, we discuss that as well. And you use both together. And then using an objective test to then conclude, discuss and conclude whether or not would the good supply in question be of satisfactory quality. Uh, and I think there are some things here we can discuss. Uh, for example, right uh, here, you want to be able to identify this. There is not just a case of the fish not adjusting well, they all died. It's not five years later, it's five days later. Leave no facts unused. The facts are given for discussion. Five days later. Now, look at 93E, durability. Goods supplied must be durable. Five days for sure is not durable, right? Uh, and of course now, the wrong chemicals. You supply fish that comes with water, the water has got the chemicals wrong, right? Objectively, when a fish seller sells you fish with wrong chemicals in the water, resulting in all the fish dying in five days' time, if you are an objective person, would you regard the goods that you have now been supplied to be satisfactory? The answer is no, okay? Uh, so this part, I will leave it to you to phrase it, to write it down nicely, and to concluding that Objectively, the goods are not SQ, right? So you want to, again, do what I've just done. Please do not be very presumptuous or uh, discuss this in a very broad stroke manner. Broad stroke as in, you just mentioned SQ and then conclude that because the fish all died, breach. No, be specific. Look at what I just showed you, right? Fitness for purpose, durability price, description, all these are to be brought together in your discussion to then conclude there's a breach of 9 sub 1. And by the way, the breach is not a breach of 9 3. The breach is not a breach of 9 2. It's a breach of 9 sub section 1. 9 sub 1 is the section that imposes liability. 9 sub 1 talks about the head of liability, not 9 2, not 9 3. 9 2 is just a standard. It's just a definition of SQ. It's a definition. 93 is aspects of quality, what it includes. Even so, not exhaustive. Right? So get it right. The way you phrase your answer is a breach of 91. Now, of course, then, uh, as I covered this part of the lecture, and I'm quite certain that some of you in your mind, you are asking this question. Or maybe it could be that, you know, on the Facebook comment, you have typed in this comment. I don't know. I'm not seeing the Facebook comment, by the way. I'll do so later at the end of the session. Uh, and this would be the obvious thing that we all have spotted. Well, technically speaking, the seller is an aquarium of fish seller selling fish. And the facts were very clear, indicating that what was wrong was not so much as with the fish, but the chemical in the water. And it was that that caused the fish including even the angel fish that belonged to Loki initially to also die. So could it be where the seller tries to argue to say, nothing wrong in the fish I sell to you. It's not as if I sold you defective fish, right? Uh, so yes, I think that is a good observation uh, and something you want to discuss as well in your answer. To that, a quick, simple answer is here, that if you look at 9 sub 1, 
And if you have the time, now itself, or maybe not now, later, read the provisions of the statute. And please do do that. Read the actual sections. Do not just listen to what a lecturer say or what I say or what uh, uh, you read online. Read the act. Read the statute for yourself. In 9 sub 1, this is an implied term that when goods are supplied, it must be of satisfactory quality. In other words, the key word is the word supply, not what was sold. I may sell you something, but whatever I supply you together with what was sold must also be of SQ. One more time now, right? So I may sell you something. Let me give you an example now. I may sell you perhaps now a TV, a television set. But when I sell you a television set, I supply along with it a remote control. Now, what if the remote control does not work? Technically speaking, nothing wrong with the TV. You are not buying a remote control, are you? You are buying a TV. But the law is smart. The law is very uh, complete and thorough in a sense, where in CRA it says very clearly that the goods that are to be of satisfactory quality applies in relation to the goods supplied not just what was sold. Okay, so if I supply you the TV together with remote control, I supply you the TV and supply you also with a cable, all the goods supplied, the keyword is the word supplied, must be of SQ. If you are thinking I am splitting hairs, you know, hey, David, you're just simply grasping at straws, arguing. No, I'm not because there are cases saying this. And so we have a case called Gelling and Marsh, uh, this was a case concerning where a seller had sold to the buyer mineral water. And these were waters that were contained in the large plastic containers, the bottles of water supplied to offices. And so the seller sold mineral water to the buyer, but the bottle was defective. The bottle exploded. The water all leaked out. So the buyer sued the seller. But when the buyer sued the seller, the seller argued, but you are buying from me and I'm selling you water. I'm not selling you bottles. I'm selling you water. And there's nothing wrong with the water. It's all safe, all good. The same argument that you are not seeing here that we are raising for this discussion for the question is exactly or more or less similar to what happened in the case of Gadling and Marsh. And the court said, no, the implied term of quality applies to all goods supplied under the contract, not just what was bought, not just what was ordered or sold in that contract. Now, this case, of course, the case under SOGA, not a CRA case. Uh, I think so far we would have one CRA case, uh, and even so it was just, I think, this year or last year. Uh, but this is a much older case, and it was a, it's a SOGA case, but same discussion. Right? So because of that, that's why we can use this to supporting our argument here. It's not just one case. There's also a case called Wilson and Richard Cockrell. Uh, because of time, I won't go to with you this case, but suffice that there are authorities confirming what I've just said, in that the implied term of SQ applies not just to the fish sold, but also to the water supplied and the chemicals within the water. And since it is not of satisfactory quality, it has resulted in the fish to die, therefore breach of nine sub one, right? So that's our conclusion. And you would have noticed that I've taken you step by step, right? To arriving at this conclusion. Do not rush through your answer. You have 45 minutes. Uh, you have time to write out your answer, right? In fact, uh, I'm not so sure about your new exam format. Uh, if you're taking in July, because of the COVID-19 situation, uh, there may be changes to the exam exam formatting, the timings and so forth. Uh, so I don't know how it would pan out eventually, but using the conventional exam format, you have 45 minutes per question, right? And you can see quite a bit, yeah? So take your time and argue all this. Uh, then we now come to this part, part about the remedies for breach. And as I said to you, uh, that the CRA provides additional remedies to a consumer buyer. Uh, it's different from SOGA. Uh, so got the remedies are uh, basically to recognize a breach to be a breach of a condition. 
as opposed to a warranty. Yeah? So SOGA will treat it to be a breach of warranty or condition, and then you can have the option to repudiate your contract, reject the goods, and sue for damages. But the CRA has got additional remedies. I'll call what I call the five R's found in section 19 sub one of the CRA. Uh, this is something which many students gloss over and don't pay attention to, but you have to know this because this question is concerning the CRA. This question concerns the remedies for Loki. Advise Loki. What would he want to be advised on? 19 sub one. It tells him that he has these five R's. The first R is a right of injection. The second R is a right to repair. A third R is a right to replace as a replacement of goods. Now, so technically speaking, he may say, well, I want new fish, right? Why not? Of course, you can't repair the fish, right? Uh, but then sure, go for replace. Uh, reduce the price. Although I don't think it's advisable here because the fish are not too expensive to begin with. And still, a final right of rejection. Five R's. You know, you're seeing that there are two rejections. Uh, the first and the fifth, and it's because the first rejection is what we will call as a short-term right of rejection to be exercised within 30 days. This is then where once you exceed the 30 days, you lose that first remedy. Then you have to go down to repair, replace, or to reduce price, if not now, to reject. Now, it's tiered, T-I-E-R-E-D, is tiered, staggered, in the following way. So although I say five R's, you don't discuss all five together. You don't give to the buyer, consumer, all five. That's wrong, okay? Look at now my next slide, where it's actually structured over three tiers. Now my next few slides will be quite worthy. Uh, and so I would think it's impossible for you to take down everything uh, if you're doing so by pen. Whereas uh, up to so far, I have made the effort to speak slowly. Uh, and you would have been able to properly take down notes. Uh, whereas here, uh, don't bother. Uh, I don't think I want you to anyway, but I'm sure you know, right? Uh, there are very uh, effective ways of taking down this whole thing I have on the screen. Uh, with technology, it's amazing, right? Uh, so I leave it up to you now to how you want to take this down. Uh, so just capture this, right? And then you can slowly on your own device. Uh, the other thing is that what I may do is uh, I have a Facebook page, uh, as you are now on it, of course. I also have a YouTube channel. Uh, and on YouTube channel, I post other videos uh, concerning uh, So I may post this first year. It talks about the short term right of rejection and it's within 30 days. Uh, you can, of course, after five days, decide now, or four days for the matter, decide you want to reject. It's up to you. But they give you up to 30 days. This is so, so different from SOGA, right? Uh, I won't talk about SOGA here now, uh, but maybe for my commercial law students, I may do that, a separate session on this, on uh, right of rejection. That's governed by section 11 of SOGA, section 35 of SOGA and all that. Otherwise, this is 30 days, and if you exceed the 30 days, then you can't reject it anymore on this first tier, but it doesn't matter. You now have a second tier. The second tier is where you have a replacement. Repair, replace is same level. So it's not repair, replace as in one on top of the other, but they are both same level. This is recognized as a second tier where you choose one of the two you choose repair or replace. For this question, very easy. Nothing to repair, you replace. However, there are some types of other situations where maybe it could be repaired. So for example, if this is say uh, my handphone and it's a scratch on the phone, I can repair it, it's a scratch, or I can replace the whole thing. Now, which one would you think I want? Now, of course, it depends on who you are or what you want. Uh, but what I want to, you to show, show you is this. If you look at your second paragraph, and again, my cursor, I hope you can see my cursor, shows you this to you, where the chosen remedy must not be disproportionate compared to the other remedy, right? 
Uh, I think actually I can uh, do an annotation here on the screen. Right, this one, right? It must not be disproportionate compared to the other remedy. And this is, and unlike this now, this is an important phrase because this is exactly how you decide what you will get or what the law allows you to get. You can ask for one or the other, but you cannot be given the one remedy if it is unfair or disproportionate to the other remedy. To say, for example, in the case of a scratch, which can be easily replaced by just replacing the screen or, or the protective cover, I think most phones have now, remove that protective cover, put a new one, there's no more scratch. Compared to replacing the whole phone, obviously the law will say that replacing is an undue burden that's disproportionate to give you this remedy when a simple repair equally effective can also provide you with a redress. And so therefore, in my example of a scratch on the screen, maybe as opposed to the law recognizing or allowing you to replace, they'll give you a repair. So it depends on the circumstance. Now, obviously I use a very simple example of a phone that's scratch. What if this is a case of a car and it's a complex item and something is wrong with the engine? Now, if you had bought a brand new car, something is wrong with the engine. Now, the shop, the seller may say, don't worry, I can repair the car for you. Leave it with me for two months, I'll repair for you. Now, sure, you may go along, but if it's a brand new car, it takes two months to repair the engine. Would you want to risk it, let it repair, not knowing whether the repairs will be really good or effective or not? Or would you instead choose to for a replacement car? I would choose for a replacement. Right? So from my examples, you're seeing that there is this option available in the second tier to choose one or the other. And the choice must not be disproportionate. Also, look at the first paragraph. Uh, the trader must provide that repair replacement within a reasonable time and without causing significant inconvenience to the consumer and at no cost. I've seen uh, some other questions. Uh, I can't remember, is it contract commercial law, uh, where the seller tries to impose a cost to the other party. You can't do that, okay? Uh, so please take note now of the annotated words, I uh, lines I have on the screen uh, to show you how to understand this right to repair or replace. Uh, the third one, right, would be a right to reduction of price and a final rejection, the final two Rs. And this is number three as a third tier. So in summary, one more time now, this will be your short term 30 days right of rejection. Then number two, would be your right of repair or replace. And even if that fails, right? So sometimes even after the repair, it's not working well. The replacement item is still with a problem, right? Uh, so despite the second tier, things may still not be okay. And it's where now you have a third tier. The third tier now is here, a right to reduce price or a right to now reject. Again, the word all is caps and in red, it's either one, reduce price, or the other to reject, right? And again, you can read this for yourself now uh, to see how it works. Uh, so I suppose it depends really on the buyer at this juncture. It may be that he says, doesn't matter, I can live with the problem, I will reduce the price. But I think that if it's concerning a mechanical eye, like a car, in my early example, why would I want to reduce the price of a car and stuck with a defective, not good condition car. I want to reject, right? Uh, so that's really all available. Uh, this next slide is where I'm showing you now a summary of what are the statutory remedies. The same phrase I used just now. These are not contractual remedies per se, not given or recognized in common law, but by statute. And this is your first tier, your second tier, and your third tier, okay? Uh, so with that, it's a good summary. Now, before I look at a different point with you, I wanna show you also in a broader sense, all the available remedies, depending as to the type of breach in question, uh, in my next slide. 
And so, for example, here you find that this is an overview of the CRA remedies. And when I mentioned that there is this three-tiered remedy, the three-tiered remedy that you're seeing here, uh, this part here now, the three-tiered remedy, right, one, two, three, is only for a breach of these impact terms or these statute rights. Now, I know there are quite a bit, and the main one, of course, uh, for example, Q9, right, the main one, also another common one, fitness of purpose. Of course, description, right, 1911, these are the three main ones. But I want you to see that your Consumer Rights Act has got more than just this square box, uh, this red color square box impact terms. You have other impact terms. For example, you have section 12, you have 15, you have 17. And I want to show you now this, the breach of the impact term in 12 gives you instead now this remedy. A breach of the impact term in 15, a right to have goods installed correctly, gives you now this remedy. It's not treated here. If you breach 17, right to supply, you get this remedy, okay? Again, what I'm showing to you is this. It's not treated here. The treated remedy is the main one, no doubt. And in fact, many of you know this, uh, I suppose, I hope, uh, in the course of a preparation that you know about the treated remedy and you think that it's what the CRA remedy gives you, that whenever it's a breach of implied term, treated remedy. Wrong. It's only when you are in breach of 9, 10, 11, 13, 14, 16, that you get a treated remedy. You breach the implied term of right to sell. 17, uh, by the way, uh, is the equivalent of SOGA, section 12 right to sell, it is right to supply. You don't get three tiers. You only have one tier, one right, one remedy, right to reject, okay? Uh, so this is the corresponding on the left side, all the statute rights that a consumer buyer today has. And depending on what is being breached, correspondingly now, the remedies are available over the right side, okay? Again, I put down one section 19 there in a very broad sense for you. Uh, but you would want to read the statute yourself. Uh, 19 is a main section, but it's 20, 21, all the way to 24, I think, right? Uh, so please read it for yourself for an overview of the remedies. Now, but whilst we have, in a way, given Loki an advice on the remedies, that is not what this question is about. If you look at the question, are we told Loki wanting to have a replacement fish? No. He doesn't want to reject anything? No, the fish are dead anyway. You know what this question is about. It's about suing for damages. But guess what? So far, we have not talked anything about damages. But it is recognized as well, of course, where over and above. The statute remedies as seen in the earlier table, this also recognizes. I think this one is in section 19, subsection something, right? I can't get the number right. Uh, but one of the subsections now say this, that damage is still available for breach of contract. Uh, remedies for breach of contract is damages. So you get that now because it's also not just a breach of statute, right? It gives you statute remedies. It's also a breach of contract that now also gives you contract right, which will be damages. But importantly now, of course, is that there can be no double recovery. We can allow you now to pursue your consumer remedies, having been sort of, sort of compensated by those remedies to still sue for financial compensation damages. It ends up being a double recovery. So for that, we won't allow, right? Uh, so in this instance, because of how CRA recognizes for claim for damages, uh, prima facie, Lockheed can sue to recover for the 500 pounds in compensation to replacing all the fish, uh, prima facie, including the expensive angel fish. But uh, again, where many students would end the part of the discussion here, this is not the end. You are told that this is an expensive angel fish for a reason, because if I am aquatics, the seller, I will say, but how would I know that you 
put this fish that I sell you into the aquarium with your angel fish? And how would I know that your angel fish is so expensive? What if now you put it into an aquarium with a very exotic fish, and now that fish costs 10 million? I mean, at this episode I know, but 10,000. And now must I compensate you 10,000 for some fish I've sold you for a couple of bucks? And now your expensive, whatever fish now has died, your golden arawa perhaps, that could cost 20, 50,000. Must I compensate that to you? And that's really why then this is the facts told to you. So please do not just end your answer, but go on further. Right? I have this particular uh, mantra or this uh, line, which I always tell my students. When you think you have found the answer, look again. When you think you have found the answer, you think you have finished, look again. You have not, right? There might be something else. And so now there is that something else. So for example, here would be where you know, ask what I was trying to raise with you as an issue, but now to use a legal term, is the law suffered too unforeseeable, not within the party's contemplation, and the word now, the legal word use, too remote. And this is the case of Halle Baxter deal, uh, which is a topic which we cover, usually the last topic of the syllabus in contract law, right? remedies for breach of contract, damages, and then that's where you have this case of Hadley Baxter deal. It's a case with the House of Lords. It's a famous leading case. And it lays out for us now the principles of how is it that we know that the losses can be recovered, not too remote, and that is provided. And it's a two limb test. The first limb is if these are losses that arise naturally in the ordinary course of events, then this is a loss that you can recover. It's a natural loss. It's an obvious loss. Then you can recover. Now, I give you a few seconds to think through, and maybe you could type in the answer on a Facebook comment. Would you think that the death of the angel fish, this expensive fish they were told, they cost close to 500 pounds? It's a lot of money for a fish. Is that a loss that would arise naturally in the ordinary course of events? Now, obviously, it's no easy answer. It's arguable, right? Uh, because, I mean, in fact, uh, if I could, I mean, poll with you. Uh, maybe our next session, uh, I don't know, well, would you all agree? Maybe you just uh, type in your answer as well. Uh, we should do a Zoom class so I can talk with you. Uh, I can hear you, you can hear me. So we can have an actual session, right? like a classroom. Uh, Zoom allows us to do that, right? Uh, whereas Facebook, uh, you, you, we can't. So anyway, what would you think is the answer? Would you think that the angelfish is a natural loss? Now, if you say yes, then that's it. Uh, we have found the answer. Since it is a natural loss, not too remote, you can recover. Assuming that you conclude to say, no, David, it's not a natural loss. How would the seller know that they will be this expensive angelfish dying? It's not a natural loss. If you were to take the view, then it's where then you then discuss and come down to the second limb to then ask, well, what about this other limb that could allow for the loss to be recovered still? And that is if the loss or if the losses are within the party's reasonable contemplation. So would it be something that could have been objectively reasonable within the party's contemplation? So I suppose not wrong to say that an angel fish and the expensive fish dying might not be ordinary, but it is something that can perhaps be within their contemplation, objectively. This is my argument, right? And so with that, I conclude that uh, it's recoverable either under limb one, if not for sure, limb two, or at least arguably limb two, okay? Uh, so I hear in my answer for limb one, uh, but I think even limb two itself, it's possible. 
but either one, right? One or two is where then you can recover, right? Uh, of course, it may be that you may disagree. Say, no, I don't think it's either one or two. How could it have been? And it's not a wrong argument, by the way. How could it have been within the party? It's plural, huh? Loki. Now, of course, Loki knows where he will put the fish and in that he will put the fish together with the angel fish. So yes, that's Loki's contemplation. But this is not just Loki, right? It's party, it's plural. Loki and aquatics, both of them objectively, would it be such that this will arise, this will occur? And so maybe aquatics will argue that I did not contemplate. But I want to again stress, it's not Loki's view, neither would it be aquatics, it's your officious bystander. It's your reasonable third party. Contract law is about objective tests. Objectively, would you think that someone who buys fish, uh, who is like Loki, who even subscribes to a one-year fish purchase plan, right? It's clearly a fish lover. It's not a random one-off, one-time purchase. Loki subscribe to this particular membership of purchasing fish every month or something, right? And so he will obviously have other fish. And so it is possible to be within their contemplation. And that's why I say that it's something that will be recoverable, right? Uh, of course, this is also in some sense like a cheat mode. They're cheating, right? Uh, in the sense that we want to conclude that the loss is not too remote so that we can now discuss the next part, which is the exclusion clause. Otherwise, then your exclusion clause cannot be discussed. Because if the laws had been too remote in the first place, if the 500 pounds been too remote, then the next part of the answer is redundant, right? Obsolete. Uh, so just nice that we concluded the way I did that the damages or the losses are not too remote. And then now we discuss this, right? Uh, so this is the clause you saw in the question that limited the liability to 10 pounds. And so we want to address now these three questions uh, and that is recovery of this amount. And then how does common law, then later how the statute regulate these clauses. And so we are at the tail end of uh, the question now. Uh, I hope I can end by 11.30. I know it's getting late. Uh, I chose 10 p.m. Uh, time because uh, it's a time that I thought that people from all over the world uh, will have a reasonable window uh, to attend this session. You know? uh, otherwise, that just benefits one group and not the other group. Uh, so I don't know where you are. In fact, uh, maybe do me a favor. Uh, since you are watching this, uh, I would like to know where you're from. Uh, maybe in your comment box, just type in, you know, I'm from Hong Kong. I'm from I know, Middle East. I'm from Pakistan. right? Uh, so I know where you are watching from. Then I can with that also plan uh, future sessions to try to adjust the timing to one that is common timing that's fair for all parties. Now, so here would be exclusion clause and move on to finish this question. Uh, I said just now that we want to look at We want to discuss or no to filter out whether or not would exclusion clauses be valid. Because if it's not incorporated, you know, not signed to by the parties, then therefore maybe it's not valid, right? So this is the argument. Uh, but in this question, we were not told of any signing. Uh, for buying goldfish, you don't normally sign anyway. So it does not apply on a fax, right? Uh, so we won't discuss this, but again, I've given you some extra stuff here. Uh, now you have all this in your subject guide, I believe, uh, your textbook also, or your notes. Uh, that talks about how in general, of course, there's the exception later in your next paragraph, but in general, one is bound to what he has signed. Assuming and if Lockheed signs something, he's bound to it. Unless, of course, there are some visioning factors. But still, as I mentioned, this does not apply on a fax. Rather, uh, still under common law and incorporation, we just incorporation by notice, where there are three requirements to be satisfied. 
Uh, first is that the notice must be given before the contract. And in this instance now, it is satisfied, appears to be so on the facts. Uh, if it's cut off uh, by the video, uh, I'm seeing here in the blue box that it is satisfied, that the notice seems to be given before the contract, appears to be so. Ah, here is a little bit more contentious. It must be in a contractual type document. And when we say that it must be in a contractual type document, what I mean is that this must be in a document understood to contain contract terms. Compared to where it's a mere voucher, it's a mere receipt that people do not generally objectively perceive, recognize or understand for it to be containing contract terms, document. Now, would it be so? The facts are somewhat vague. We don't really know for certain, but we are told that there was this notice at a cash desk. Now, when you see a notice at a cash desk, would you perceive that to be containing contract terms? So that's why I put the word, is it adequate? Maybe it could be a promotion, right? Maybe it could be dealing with payment methods. Uh, we see notices at the cash desk. Uh, how would we know that it contains contract terms? But it could be, right, possible, because that's also where the final frontier, so to speak, of where the seller can tell you or communicate certain important terms to you at the payment counter, so possible. Moreover, and to satisfy this requirement, uh, if you look at the question, uh, you find that the seller, this was the aquatic salesperson, uh, also mentions right to the buyer, Loki, to refer to the notice. They will contain terms and conditions. Now, I know that Loki did not wear his glasses, did not read the notice. The issue for now is not whether did Loki read, it's not did Loki know. Look at the requirements now. Number one, was a notice given before the contract? Was it given in a contractual type document? Whether the party understands it or, or not is a separate issue, right, for now. And so here I will argue that because the sales assistant has brought it up to saying that please ask us, or uh, there's a notice that says, please ask the cashier for the term conditions. I think therefore that would have prompted or allowed for a person to realize that there are terms and conditions, okay? Now, of course, then this is the comment that you have, which is my last point. Even though the note did mention the word terms and conditions, and I think that very clearly, in my opinion, the label terms and conditions that appeared in the notice uh, would clearly would have conveyed that it's a contractual type document, right? Containing contract terms. But the third requirement is this. Reasonable steps must be taken to notify the other party of the clause. And then you have the cases. And now this would be a problem, right? Uh, whether or not has steps been taken to notify the other party of the clause. Now, so for example, uh, I want to just set out some basic principles here uh, from these cases of Parker and Thornton. Uh, the first bullet point is that the requirement or the law is that the seller is to have taken steps to notify. It's not about whether the buyer has seen or read or has understood the terms, right? Notice now the focus is not on the buyer receiving, but on me notifying, on the seller me notifying you. So if I've taken steps to notify, that's good enough. Uh, so therefore the part of the glasses, you discuss it. And this may perhaps now be to the detriment of Lockheed if he himself did not wear the spectacles. I mean, I'm a seller. How do I know you can't read so well, right? Uh, if you know you can't read so well, you know you can't see the words very clearly, then you should wear your specs. Uh, so this is the argument, right? And moreover, from the case of Parker and Thornton, incorporation by reference, and this is a correct label that you want to use now, may be permitted. Now, what is this incorporation by reference? It's where sometimes you may uh, say, please refer to my website for the terms and conditions. So right now, I am not giving you the terms. 
but rather incorporating the terms by reference to the terms that are found in my website. And so very commonly it's done. Uh, take for example, where you are making an online contract uh, and you will be given a page that asks you to click to read the terms and conditions. Now, the terms are not on the page. It's found elsewhere. Uh, that is an example of incorporation by reference, right? Uh, where they incorporate that website term by referring to it here to ask you to click. So you click, you find out. So that's okay. The law allows for that. But the most important part now, and this will be my last bullet point here, is that this is only if provided that it is reasonable. Now, so is it reasonable? So I put a uh, tick here now. This being the part that's most important. The principle is that it must be reasonable reference to an external document, to a website perhaps. Now, and so here is my argument. It may not be reasonable. Now, this can go either way. Uh, but for now, I want to take the view that it may not be reasonable because this is at the point of purchase, at the payment it might not really be very ideal or appropriate for you now to still ask them or, or impose a burden on the buyer to still ask for, oh, can I please have a look at your terms and conditions? This is a bit like, for example, now, uh, if you are buying burger at McDonald's, I mean, once you reach the cashier, what do you do? You pay, right? You order, you pay. It's no longer reasonable now to still be asking for terms and conditions to be given a document to still read. There are people queuing behind you, right? Now, my early example was concerning an online contract. Now, that is different, isn't it? Because an online contract, I think it's very reasonable for me to say, before you pay, please go to this website to read. You can and you should. But in a physical store, it's not so similar. May not be. May not be so reasonable to say, please ask for the terms and conditions at the cashier area. Moreover, the reason why really I say that this third requirement is not satisfied is because you notice that the requirement is that steps must be taken to notify. Look at the facts of the question. What was done? Was there anything done to notify? Apart from the notice to say, please ask the cashier for terms and conditions. But what else? In fact, when Loki arrived at the cashier, what did the cashier say or tell to Loki? He said, would you like to subscribe for a 12-month plan to buy more fish? It costs you so much. Now, if you had the time to upsell a service, you can also explain, or by the way, please take note that there's a liability or there's a limitation clause or Say something concerning your terms and conditions. The cashier had every opportunity to talk to the customer, and he did, but to sell a product or service, the subscription. Did not at all mention anything. You know, at the very least, he could have said, or oh, sir, did you read our terms and conditions? Or oh, sir, are you familiar with our store policy? That's what people do, right? I mean, sure, maybe you may not want to be explaining all your five or 10 conditions, but a question can be asked. Are you aware of our store policy? But all I'm saying is this, the question is totally silent. Nothing was mentioned whatsoever of any steps taken to notify. And for that, that's why I would conclude that the third requirement is not satisfied, right? Uh, so that's how common law deal with exclusion clauses. Apart from that, uh, under still common law, there's also your construction rule, uh, the famous one called contra proferentum rule, which in Latin and in English, it means this, where in cases of ambiguity, such kind of exclusion or exemption clause will be construed against the party relying on the clause. And so this is a rule of construction that judges or common law has as a weapon to striking down exclusion clauses if they are ambiguity. Now again, of course, uh, if this was an actual class, I would have asked you to read the clause uh, and to identify the ambiguity, uh, but because we are not in class and because of time as well, 
Let me show you what is the ambiguity. And you can go back and look at the question and you can see how that they ask about whatsoever, howsoever, right? Uh, and those are clearly words that are ambiguous, right? So therefore, even using this contra preferentum rule, we may construe this particular clause very narrowly to say it may not apply to this situation, right? Uh, again, I don't want to expand further because of time. Please read up further on this uh, for you to expand this further in your answer. Uh, but part of the reason why I am not giving so much focus in this slide or this discussion is because of this, that we have a case called photo production and security code that states that current judicial position and where the judge very clearly said that we ought not rely on common law on judicial controls to distort the exclusion clause. EC, EC is short form of exclusion clause to distort the exclusion clause where it's no longer necessary because of statute. So the judge was making reference back then, of course, to ACTA, where it says now that we have statute, we have ACTA. We don't need to still have judges to resort to construction, to principles of incorporation, to ask about the signing, to ask about the notice given when reasonable, no longer necessary because we have statute that regulates exclusion clauses. So that's by reference to ACTA. But equally, same sentiment or command came to the CRA. And that's why for that reason, uh, we can quote this case to sort of downplay the importance or the focus on common law. We focus instead now on statute, which will be the last part of our answer now, the CRA, okay? And so let's look at now the CRA and your next slide. Uh, here would be a broad slide uh, which allows to capture, broadly speaking, uh, the key sections in the CRA, dealing with on the left side, uh, the three sections, depending as to the type of contract in question, and if you're trying to exclude from the statute right, not binding. The clause, the exclusion clause, will not be binding on a consumer. So for us now, of course, we use section uh, 31. Why 31? Because this is a contract for the supply of goods. Had this question been on services, we use 57, right? Uh, but notice, of course, that uh, there's also the other two parts uh, in the middle. Uh, if this is a trader trying to exclude liability from death of injury or injury, we use 65. Uh, if it's unfair term, we use 62. And unfair term, just exclusion term, not binding. And I'll say more on unfair term shortly afterwards as well. But before we look at the unfair term, although we seem to now have some kind of conclusion where we can say, oh, 31, exclusion clause is not binding against the consumer. That seems to be the end of the matter. So the clause that limited liability to 10 pounds, not binding on the consumer. So hooray, right? Lockheed can sue for your 500 pounds, provided it's not too remote. But that's not again the end. So when you think that you've found an answer, look again. So here now would be the next part where you would want to ask this question, which is in the first place, is the clause even an exclusion clause? Now, why do I ask this question? Because the seller is actually stating that he is liable, but that he's limiting the extent of his liability to 10 pounds. Now, is he saying that I will not be responsible for losses? Is he saying that a buyer shall not sue me for any breach of contract? Is he saying that goods sold are non-refundable? The typical kind of disclaimer clause that we see of an exclusion clause? No, he is limiting his liability as opposed to exempting himself from or excluding himself from liability. And so one more time, he's actually saying, I am willing to be liable, but just up to 10 pounds. Moreover, how much would that fish had cost? I think it's about 10 pounds, right? I forgot the exact amount. And so as far as the seller's concerned, I sell you a 10 pound dollar fish. I will limit my liability to 10 pounds. I will pay you. I'm not excluding liability. 
And so therefore you need to then draw reference to 31 sub two of the theory. Uh, where in 31 sub two. So what I'm discussing is not just a random abstract issue, is something which is governed by statute. We have a 31 sub 2 in the CRA that deals with this kind of funny, peculiar argument of exclusion clauses not being exclusion clause, where they say that even where such kinds of limitation clause is also not binding. Now, 31 sub 2 really uh, is similar to 31, 13 sub 1 of ACTA uh, in maybe a future possible session, I will discuss with you ACTA, uh, and it's a 13 sub 1 of ACTA, it talks about different varieties of exclusion clauses. That has been taken and put into 31 sub 2. It's practically identical. You compare both sections, it's very similar. And it deals with varieties of different types of exclusion clauses. And the effect is that such kinds of limitation clause such kinds of duty defining clause, there's a term academics use, as was in the case of Smith and Eric Bush, is a variety of exclusion clause. So we recognize that, right, to be a type of or variety of exclusion clause. Now, in case you're wondering, what is a duty defining clause? Uh, I have a next slide afterwards, but for now, briefly, it means that it's a clause that is not in the First instance, appearing as if that the seller is excluding liability. Rather, the seller is merely putting the duty on you to saying it is your duty to make sure you check the goods. Now, so there's a duty defining clause to say it's the duty, as an example, uh, the duty of a buyer to examine the goods. And so therefore, if you don't examine, that's it, then you can't sue me. I am not excluded from liability. I'm saying you can't even sue me in the first place. We are negating liability. There's no cause of action arising in the first place. It's actually a very clever way by sellers trying to draft a clause like that to make it a duty defining clause to imposing a duty on a buyer. And then when the buyer says, oh, you're trying to exclude liability, he will say, no, I'm not. You have yourself failed the duty by not checking the goods before you buy, right? And so try to evade, try to evade from the CRA. But we know the answer now, that in 13 of ACTA, in 31 sub 2 of CRA, this is defined, included as a variety of exclusion clause. So therefore, ACTA, CRA can apply to this clause, right? Uh, so in this next slide will be uh, some examples of what could be varieties of exclusion clause. I've mentioned now uh, these two already, but here are some specific examples. And I know it's drawing late for some of you. Uh, so I'll just uh, show this very quickly. Look at the first for example. Notice of defects must be within or notified within one day of purchase. Now we get it all the time. Again, the same issue that we're discussing here would arise here for this clause. Is this really in the first instance an exclusion clause? Am I seeing as a seller that I am not responsible? No, all I'm seeing is this, that if the goods are defective, I will repair, I will replace, I'll refund. But you must tell me within what they duty defining clause. So the cell is trying to be funny. But that's my point, right? Uh, 13 of ACTA, 31 of CRA, makes it a variety of exclusion clause. So although the seller may be trying to say that it's not an exclusion clause, but it be taken as a variety of EC. As with, of course, uh, this other example, right? In fact, I'll show you a few others now. All these are uh, examples of varieties of exclusion clauses, and a seller may try to argue it's not, but it will be. And therefore, CRA can apply, ACTA can apply to regulate or even to strike down that exclusion clause in the case of CRA as not binding against a consumer. 
And when it's not binding against a consumer, this means to say that the consumer is not bound by the exclusion clause, Lockheed can now sue for the 500 pounds, right? Uh, so the last part of the answer in my remaining five, 10 minutes would be the unfair term, which the COA will regulate as well. Uh, by the way, a quick comment, please be very careful. ACTA does not regulate unfair terms. I know it's called the Unfair Contract Terms Act, but it is not dealing with unfair terms as such. Rather, it's dealing with a specific type of unfair term. The Unfair Contract Terms Act deals with a specific type of unfair term, which is dealing with exclusion terms. So that's what ACTA is for, to regulating exclusion terms. It is not meant to regulate other types of unfair terms. So in the regard, you find that ACTA is somewhat lacking. And so if I were to do with you now a critical essay question on this area, I have so much more to say, obviously, uh, you realize that ACTA is quite lacking in that regard, especially more so when you now want to compare with the CRA. The CRA uh, specifically deals with unfair terms. In fact, if you were to look at uh, my earlier uh, table, right? Uh, that would be what you see already, right? Look at here now in this particular slide. Uh, you find that we have sections dealing with exclusions from impact terms, exclusions from negligence. Then you have now 62 different portion in the CRA that deals with unfair term. So that's my point, right? Do not treat it in a, like a broad lump sum discussion. Everything not binding. No, it is not binding, I know. But look at the statute, different sections. Why different sections? Because an exclusion clause is not the same thing as an unfair term. Okay, a 31 situation is not the same thing as a 62 sub one situation, right? Uh, so let's now discuss that 62 situation very quickly. Uh, so as I said, the theory regulates unfair terms. And uh, so here would be a picture that shows you the regulation and the key sections. So for example, you have here now uh, this table that will give you point by point how you can expand and discuss this. I will only expand some points afterwards. The rest uh, will be a bit too detailed and not required for contract law. And over here would be consumer notices. So CRA, now the sections are same, right? 62 sub one over the other side, Subsection two, whether it be unfair term, which is not binding, or unfair notice, also not binding, right? So it might not be a term, just a notice. But if it's unfair, not binding. But the key thing that we want to discuss afterwards, and it's important now, is of course the definition of what is unfair term or the definition of what is unfair notice, right? Uh, let's look at it now quickly in 62, and it's here in your next slide, where there are three components. And this part you have to discuss. Uh, even if it is where you're running short of time, please plan your answer properly and try to arrive at this position where you have time to discuss this adequately. If you're not, you lose marks, right? Because it's important. Uh, so here will be the three limbs that you have to satisfy, all found in statute. Don't have to take this down, right? It's in statute. Take note of the number, refer to the statute. And if this is a term that's not in good faith, it creates a significant imbalance in the party's rights and obligations. It causes a detriment to consumer. And all three will have to be satisfied. All three, not just one or the other, but all three. Then it's an unfair term. And being an unfair term, it will not be binding. The only point that I would expand more in bold, as you can see here now, is good faith. You no know, imbalance, detriment, I think it's a factual finding. It's a common sense, logical response. I leave it up to you now to discuss in a given question. But good faith, what do we mean by good faith? And so we have a case by the House of Lords, the now Supreme Court, which interpreted this uh, based on the old regulation previously. 
Uh, today, that old regulation today has been found incorporated into CRA. So therefore, we can use the same case, even though it's a pre-CRA case. Uh, and they define good faith as involving two components, fairness and openness. And again, see this for yourself now what it means uh, from this case by the House of Lords, fair as in, in a typical ordinary objective sense, fair, do not take advantage of the other party. And this is very often dealing with the case of one party who is in a superior position and the other party is suffering from some kind of weakness, maybe lack of uh, skills to understand a contract, uh, not familiar with the English language, uh, maybe low IQ, let's say. Uh, and so if you know that someone is a weaker party, an inferior party, a bit like duress kind of situation, huh? and you take advantage of the person, you exploit the person's indigenous disadvantage. Uh, that would be unfair, right? So it must be fair. Separately, the second thing that's a separate discussion, a distinct component is openness. Your term must be open. And by open again, you have to take steps to inform. You can't use you know, uh, legal jargon, Latin phrases, long sentences, technical language, because this is not open. You're trying to camouflage, trying to hide, trying to be funny, to conceal you know, uh, a technical clause there. Hopefully the other party don't see it or don't understand. No, that won't work. The law now says very clearly, it must be fully expressed, clear and legible. Uh, and in 63 sub one, uh, it makes reference to a schedule two, and schedule two is found at the end of your CRA. There's a Schedule 2 for ACTA. This is a Schedule 2 for CRA, which contains a gray list, 20 non-exhaustive indications of unfairness. It's not a black list. It's gray, right? Gray as in arguable. It indicates. That's why it's called indication. It indicates it's unfair. Now, so you want to look at your statute. Be familiar with the 20. No need to memorize, but at least I've gone through it so that on exam day, you know which one it is that is relevant and you discuss accordingly. And because on exam day, since it's not your first time seeing it, uh, you should be able to quickly understand which one will apply to a given question. Uh, for now, right, as we close, uh, what is relevant to our facts now would be uh, paragraph one. And it's because of the clause that limits liability to 10 pounds which is a limitation of liability. And so that is an indication on fair term. So here is where the clause concerning limitation of liability, we discussed that just now as a variety of exclusion clause, but not just that, I'm not seeing. It's also indication that it's unfair. So either limb or either part can strike down this particular term. Uh, what then about the other clause? The one concerning the cancellation fee. And here are three separate paragraphs in Schedule 2. Paragraph 5, 6, and 10. Right, on your own, you read these three paragraphs. Right, again, please read it from your statute book and you will see what I mean. Disproportionate compensation for services when a customer, consumer withdraws prematurely. Disproportionate compensation payable by consumer in the event of breach. And the last one, consumer has no real chance of becoming acquainted with the term. Our friend Lockheed never really read the term. Right? So that's why it's paragraph 10. Right? So we use this tree to argue that it's an indication of an unfair term. And if so, if it is an unfair term as defined in 62, our earlier slide, then therefore the clause is not binding against Loki. Loki will not need to pay for that 300 pounds cancellation fee. Right, so with that, uh, we come to a conclusion. And if time permits in your actual answer on exam day, it's always good to have a nice conclusion that's structured, that summarizes all your above paragraphs. And here is where there's a breach of contract by aquatics, 
a breach of section 9 sub 1 in particular for Lockheed to be able to recover losses and that the two clauses might not be binding against him because it's an exclusion term and or an unfair term, right? Uh, with that, thank you so much uh, for joining me this session. Uh, I think timing is just nice, actually, uh, two hours for this question. Uh, I've taken longer sometimes, uh, but here will be some uh, social media pages that I have that many of you are already subscribed to. If not, do me a favor uh, for me to prepare or to give you more of these materials to just go online to share or to like those pages or subscribe to that. Uh, if you have any questions, you can drop me a note here on my Facebook page. You could always email me at justlaws 4 you at gmail.com. Uh, so with that, uh, we would have finished the lecture. Uh, I will still stay online for a while longer uh, in case there are some questions that were posted on online, uh, but it's quite late for some of you. Uh, so I don't want to hold you back. Uh, we'll take it that the session has ended. Uh, so I will stop this uh, video recording. I'll stop the Zoom uh, session and then I will use Facebook to communicate and to reply to your comments. Uh, I'll do it either now, if not maybe later or tomorrow uh, because over here it's 12 a.m., right? Uh, and my wife is waiting for me. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. Have a good night and stay safe.